Hello, everyone. Depending on where in the world you're joining us from today, a very warm good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. I'm Vinika Rao, Executive Director of the INSEAD Emerging Markets Institute, Gender Initiative and Africa Initiative, and Asia Director of the Hoffman Institute for Business and Society. It's my pleasure today to welcome you all to what I know will be a very exciting discussion on disruption, digitalization, and revolutionizing an industry. It's a story of how committed leadership and bankers who started to think like techies managed one of the most successful digital transformations in the banking industry. In their own words, they took the banking out of banking and became recognized as the world's best bank. I've personally followed DBS's transformation with great interest over the years. So I'm delighted that we're bringing you this exciting webinar, part of the series Tech Talk X, curated by Team Digital at INSEAD. A word now about the Tech Talk X series. These talks are dedicated to exploring new digital technologies and their applications, as well as the impact that they have on management, business, and society. They are both technical and business talks presented by leading technologists, thought leaders, industry practitioners, entrepreneurs, and of course, academics. They span a wide spectrum of topics on both emerging and existing technologies. And because I can't possibly tell you everything about them here, do please visit the website of digital at insead.edu for more information. And we also want to acknowledge our partner Accenture with whose support this series is organized. Uh, it's my pleasure now to invite Professor Annette Aris, Senior Affiliate Professor of Strategy at INSEAD. Annette also has extensive experience as a non-executive board member of several publicly listed companies across Europe, including the Rabobank Group. Earlier, she was also a partner at McKinsey and co-led their German media practice for several years. We're asking Annette now to set the stage for our discussions today with a short presentation on the digitalization of the banking industry. Over to you, Annette. Good morning. Good morning. There I am. Good morning to all. And um, I'm very happy to be able to give this little talk. So today I will be talking mostly as a, a professor at INSEAD. I'm a strategy professor focusing on digital transformation but also a bit with my hat on as board member of the Rabobank, um, a large Dutch bank, also active internationally in food and agriculture, and uh, one of the top 20 banks in Europe. So um, digitalization of banking industry. Before we dive into that topic, maybe a few words on the banking industry, because it has been in quite stormy weather the last years. First of all, they had to cope with the low interest income, which put a lot of pressure of one of their main sources of income. Luckily, this is looking up a bit, but it has been a tough journey. The second big thing banks are coping with is regulatory pressure, which has increased enormously, enormously over the last years. Um, we as Rabobank got about 700 instructions by the ECB and the Dutch Central Bank in 2014. And this has increased to 4,000 instructions in 2021 regarding things like know your customer, Basel 4, et cetera, et cetera. Then of course, there are the new digital entrants, both the FinTechs and the big techs which are nibbling away at very attractive profit pools at banks like remittance, lending, and payments. And last but not least, most banks are coping with huge issues with their legacy systems. Banking's, banks are becoming more and more IT companies, and many of them still have very old system, even partly programmed in COBOL. The processes are still not end-to-end, -end, and a lot of the data are not ready to be used in a digital world. So those things together put an enormous amount of things on the agenda of any bank. Let's now step back a second and look at what's happening when digitalization hits. When we talk about digitalization, I think we should really distinguish between two different effects. The first effect I would call digital disruption. And that means that your business model is fundamentally affected by digitalization. Like, for example, in the media industry, if you look at what happened in the advertising world. 
Digital transformation, on the other hand, is the way you run your company. And also this will be affected fundamentally. Just a few examples. Some industries are both digitally disrupted and have to transform the way they work fundamentally. Media industry, I already mentioned, but also the telco industry or the car in the transportation industry. Then there are a few industries, mostly manufacturing and others, which still can keep their old business model. If you look, for example, at mining, Codelco, one of the largest mining companies in the world, still digs copper out of the soil. But the way they do it has completely transformed over the past five years. And now working with people less mining, autonomous trucks, etc. Then are very few industries which are disrupted but not transformed. For example, the music industry, where people still write their songs and sing them, but the business model has changed fundamentally. And very few which still stay the same, like my hairdresser. Those are industries which where you use many, many different senses, where human interaction is very important. So let's have a quick look at the impact of both disruption and transformation. If you talk about disruption in the banking industry, I first have a question to you. Sandra, if you can put up the poll, do you think that the banking industry will be disrupted? So their business model will be fundamentally affected in the coming years by fintechs and big techs. Please let me know your thoughts. I see quite a spread in answers from completely to barely. Um, and this is not surprising because the opinions on this are very, very spread out. There are people who are convinced, like several of you, that the banking industry will not exist anymore in five to 10 years. And other people, and especially if you talk to most incumbent banks, they don't believe it will have a major impact. Yes, some parts will disappear, but the core banking business will remain with the banks. Let's have a look. And that's exactly what makes it so difficult. And so the question for a bank is, not knowing the extent to what you will be disrupted, how do you prepare for it? And so, um, and now my screen, yeah. So what happens? So what you see most companies where the business model is being disrupted and where you see that revenues drop at a fast pace, you see a number of actions. The first action is to reduce cost. Revenues go down, you have to save your profits, so you have to immediately start reducing cost. The other thing, paradoxically, is that those companies keep returning money to shareholders. Very often, they are mature industries, which are dividend shares, and the shareholders expect the dividends to keep coming. So in order to prevent the share price from dropping even more, money is still being spent on dividends. Then a lot of money is invested and resources in transforming the traditional core to digital as fast as possible. Some players start looking at other players who are weaking and start to consolidate the industry in order to capture scale and to be stronger. And then of course, companies start their own new business models to compete with the digital entrance. If that doesn't work good enough, they start buying growing digital businesses very often at a high price. If you look at all these actions together, one thing is clear, you cannot do them all at the same time. It just costs too much money and you don't have the management resources. So you have to pick and choose. And that is quite difficult. And as we will see in DBS, if you don't well, it can be very successful. Just the example of the Rabobank, what has, has it been doing? It has spent a lot of money in transforming its core to digital and by now has some fantastic apps to interact with its consumers and customers. There's of course a big cost reduction program. We keep paying the certificates uh, through the Rabo certificates money to our shareholders. We have started some very interesting new businesses, Funder, which is a lending business for SMBs and the Rabo Carbon Bank which is working in Africa and other parts of the world, working with capturing CO2 and selling, the, and selling it. 
We have rather investment, several billions, which invest in new promising businesses. And consolidating the industry is quite difficult in the Netherlands, where we have only three banks, big banks left. So a lot of work to do in addressing possible disruption. But at the same time, banks have to transform and they have to transform big time. What does it mean? It basically means if you think about the impact of digital on all the processes, it's enormous. It started with marketing and sales. The way we do marketing and sales nowadays is completely different from how it was five to 10 years ago. With return on investment, with micro-targeting and all those things. But also the production, and this is not so much for banks, but more for other companies, has changed profoundly. If you look at what the Germans called Industry 4.0, with the impact of robotics, Internet of Things, enabling production increases of about 30% productivity increases. And last but not least, the way we develop products has changed fundamentally from the traditional waterfall approaches to more agile approaches. But making the changes in processes like this possible implies that you have to redo completely the way you built your organization. You have to redo the way you do your strategy. You cannot be an ocean steamer which goes to New York, no matter what the winds and the waves are. You have to become a sailboat which reacts to new winds and new waves, but knows how to sail very well. You have to your whole setup with your data, your IT, and your decision making. You have to become much more data and algorithm driven. And what we see happening in most companies is that most companies tend to have an IT architecture which is quite vertical and which has an IT architecture product by product. And it has to flip nine degrees to a horizontal structure where you have platforms, where you have microservices and where you have a big data lake, where you have access to all your data in uniform ways. This implies also a major change in your organizational structure. Traditionally, most companies were organized in profit centers, be it countries, be it product groups, and this is not possible anymore in the digital world. You have to move to horizontal structures. The matrix which we used to have in the 90s is coming back big time. We need products and services cannot be local anymore. They need to be global. End-to-end -end processes, platforms and data need to be organized across the profit centers, as goes for the IT infrastructure. And not only do we need to move to a matrix, more and more companies are moving to agile structures with chapters, tribes, and squads. At Rabo, we completely changed our head office organization, and now we are 6,000 people are working in squads and tribes. And these can be products like mortgages, but also our HR and our risk functions are moving there, are already working there. And finally, communication will be changing. It will become much more collaborative. This is how I started many, many years ago. This is how I spent most of my life. And this is how it will be in the future. We will have chats, messenger groups, metaverse, shared diaries, and et cetera, et cetera. And this is not only a different way of communicating, this has a major impact on the culture of a company. So just summarizing, what will you need in the coming time to cope with digitization when you're a bank? You will need a digital chief digital officer. You will need an AI scientist, but the most important thing you will need is a change manager. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Annette, for that excellent overview of the disruption that banking and in fact some other industries are facing, and also how perhaps they can start trying to manage it. Now, before I ask you some follow-up questions, I want to first bring in two gentlemen who will be able to talk to us about a specific ex example of a bank that has leveraged uh, this disruption that you've told us about to bring about a transformation that has become an exemplar. So let's welcome uh, Bidyu Dumra, Executive Director and Head of Innovation, DBS Bank, and Robin Speculant, Pioneer and Specialist in Strategy and Digital Implementation, and co-author of a book on DBS, among others. Welcome both of you. 
Uh, Robin and I also recently co-authored an article for INSEAD Knowledge that highlights some of the key aspects of this transformation. Uh, I noticed a question about getting information on what we'll be discussing today, so we are certainly happy to share the link to this article with you. Sandra, if I can request you to please provide that link in chat, uh, do please do that. Thank you so much. Okay, and I want to remind you that you can send in your questions to all three of our guests through the Q&A box. So I'm going to start, uh, Annette, with a follow-up question to you first. Uh, once again, thank you for that uh, presentation. You know, set us thinking about a lot of different things that are becoming important as we talk about digital transformation. Now, of course, as, uh, as I said earlier, besides being a professor, a much-loved professor at INSEAD, you're also a board member at Rabobank, and um, you know that gives you a bird's eye view. And of course, you did give us some introduction uh, into Rabobank. But if I could ask you to tell us a little bit more about Rabobank's own experience with digital transformation. How successful have they really been, and what have some of the bigger challenges been? So I think Rabo is really ahead of the curve of many banks, I would say, with its interaction with its customers. So the, the, we have about our 9 million customers in the Netherlands interact for about 90% of the time through the app with the bank. Um, also more and more our the SMBs, which um, we have this digital lending street, they can get their loans approved in no time. So that is working really, really well. Like any other bank, we are in the midst of getting rid of all our legacy and uh, transforming to a more digital setup. And the thing which is uh, taking a lot of time is actually all the regulatory IT. So the know your customer, um, all the things uh, we have to put in place there. And that takes a large part of our IT resources. And our biggest debate every year is how to prioritize our IT and to set it up. So in that sense, uh, we would like to move quicker. It's just the enormous amount of things we have to do at the same time which makes it difficult and you have to be careful not to get clocked up in, in all the things you want to do at the same time. Having said that, I think that uh, I think Bicute will talk about that the move to agile has a, helped a lot to move quicker and to set the right priorities. I would say we are well on way, but still a long way to go. Okay, so it might be fair to say that while Rabo is um, far ahead in the consumer front end interface part, uh, there are certain other struggles, of course, that, uh, that it is facing in the back end. And of course, these can cause problems when you have new launches and you're trying to scale things up uh, quickly. So that's uh, certainly something to keep yeah. an eye on. Thank you. Thank you, Annette, for sharing that. And uh, Bidyut, moving to you now, um, as we've said um, in the introduction, DBS is clearly a case study of a bank that has managed digitalization successfully. And you've been there from the beginning. So, you know, let's ask you to tell us a little bit about how it all started way back in 2009. What kickstarted the transformation? And was it always intended to be a digital one at this scale? Sure. So just before I jump into that question, uh, Annette loved your presentation. It brought, brought back a lot of uh, joyful and painful memories uh, as you went through different uh, components. Uh, I guess the question is, uh, like they say, all big movements, uh, all big changes, they sometimes for these shifts, you require a burning platform. And I, I think for us, there were a couple of things that came together and it caused that that perfect storm. So, okay, the first one was very sadly at that, uh, if you look at a decade back around 2009, the customers used to often joke that DBS, it meant damn bloody slow. And, and that was painful. Secondly, besides the qualitative or the anecdotal, uh, at that, that year, there was an independent customer sentiment survey that was done and they ranked all the banks. And the results were that we sat right at the bottom. So we were, we were actually voted as the worst bank. So that again, uh, number two. And then the third was, of course, at that year also, we got a new CEO. Piyush Gupta came in and joined us. So we had new leadership up on the top. And for anyone that knows Piyush, uh, he's, he's definitely not afraid to kick things. So all of those things came together and that kick-started off the, uh, the transformation in earnest. So that, those are some of the, uh, the driving factors, internal and external. So from 
damn bloody slow to best bank in the world. <laughs> That's quite a move. Thank you for sharing that candidly. And um, I think one of the things that's very interesting is um, in terms of just how the pivot happened from a regular transformation to a digital one. And, and I'm sure you'll talk to us a little bit more about that. And uh, as we sort of um, talk about that, perhaps um, I also want to ask you about something that I've heard DBS leadership refer to as three waves that characterized this journey. Um, and you and I spoke about this briefly when we caught up last week. Um, and I think the acronyms used were ABC, BBIW, and B3W. Uh, I hope I've got those right. Um, so can you take us through the story behind those intriguing acronyms? <laughs> sure. Uh, OK, so we do some of our long-term thinking in, uh, let's say, five-year blocks. And coming into 2019, so, so I just painted the picture of 2009, uh, sitting at the bottom of the, uh, the ratings, damn bloody slow, et cetera. So coming into 2010, we started saying, OK, how do we plan for the next five years? And there was one thing clear. We wanted to be more than just climbing the customer charts. So we went and did some external uh, research and we started looking at the mega trends around us. And we saw there was growing internet regional trade. It was one decade on from the, the, the US and the, the China uh, agreement. There was regional urbanization. There was an adoption of technology in the region. A lot of things and a lot of activity happening in the Asian region. And then on top of that, we were also just I guess, coming off the uh, the financial crisis. So there was also this desire, uh, I guess, to distance yourself from all the chaos happening in the West. So putting those all together, we said, okay, I'll tell you what we should do is our ambition, we set our ambition, sitting here, worst bank in the world, that in five years, by 2015, we wanted to become ABC, Asian Bank of Choice. And we would do it and we would create the Asian banking way. So that became the rally cry, ABC. And we spent a lot of time on that word A because we had to define what Asian meant. And that's when another acronym came in called RED, which was to be respectful, easy to deal with and dependable. So that became the embodiment of our Asian service standards. So we pushed off a whole range of programs and some of them actually uh, mirrored what Annette was saying. And 2014 was a great year for us because 2014, we ended up getting ABC. And then we were like, okay, great. One year ahead of schedule. But we realized that while we changed, the world had changed around us even more. So coming into 2015, when we started looking at 2020, that's when we said, okay, what's happening? The fintechs are coming in. You've got the large platform companies also coming in from the other side, as, as Annette mentioned. Cost of tech was going up. The battlefield was all around digital. Consumers were becoming much more demanding for instant and contextual service. So that's where we said, okay, we have to pivot. And we said, we're gonna make the transformation a digital transformation. And from an ambition after tasting the success of ABC, we said 2020 is BBIW, best bank in the world. And that's where we said we would also make it a little bit bigger and broader where we would make banking joyful. So we would be the role models to the industry. So we push one level up. Again, raft of different digital transformation programs. And uh, 2019, we did end up picking up, uh, I guess, the banner of best bank in the world. And then again, we were like, okay, now what's next? And we, we sat down again and uh, Yes, echoing again from Annette, we had we looked at the fourth industrial revolution coming in. Uh, we looked at the aging population crisis around the world, growing inequality and unrest. And then, of course, lo and behold, the pandemic hit us. So it was around that time we were doing this shift, and that's where we did a small change from BBIW. We made it B3W. So instead of best bank in the world, we went and pivoted to Best Bank for a better world. And it was that small change in the language, but it was a complete shift in trajectory. So very much looking at how we could augment ourselves to be more purpose-driven and to reconnect with why banks were even created and started. So those are those, those three words uh, or acronyms are, are five years of effort in itself. But I guess it's more when you, you talk about transformation we understood to change a company, you're just changing a collective of people. And to change a collective of people, 
you got to make it something that's easy that they can grasp, understand, and act against. So the acronyms and the simplicity is, is just a language of change. So we found that if you could make the language of change easy, people it made it easy for people to buy in and understand and know what to do. So that's why the ABC and BBIW and B3W, uh, or even RED and all the other wonderful acronyms are powerful as change instruments. So best bank for a better world. I love that, bringing purpose into the equation. I think that's one of the acronyms that's going to stick in my head now. Thank you for sharing that with you. Um, Robin, coming to you now with the million dollar question, or perhaps these days it has to be at least a billion dollar question to be interesting <laughs> given current valuations. So why do you think DBS succeeded, uh, Robin, in their digital transformation where so many others have struggled? Um, the popular statistic is that some two out of three digital transformations fail. So what did the bank do different? And it's a great question because that's why I got so interested in what uh, DBS were doing at the time. And Bidut and Annette, thank you for setting the scene into it. And Bidut, you know, given the bigger picture, so I'll focus in in your question around the digital transformation. I was fortunate enough, uh, Piyush gave me exclusive access for two years to meet with Bidut and his colleagues and to sit and discuss. And it was, you know, when I was writing the book, it was completely absorbing, you know, going through everything the bank was doing on so many different levels across so many different areas. But it was only when, you know, when I stepped back and I started talking to other banks that I really saw the difference that what was happening. And what was that? Well, you know, every company who's going through digital transformation is facing very similar problems. And the aha moment that I had was when I started seeing it outside of DBS was their creativity to solving the problems that everyone else is facing. Now, what does that mean? So I'll give you a couple of quick examples. You know, we, we hear the comment, you know, we want to be um, a, a tech company providing a product or a service. Uh, DBS was one of the first to say it back in 2013, we're a tech service providing financial services. But it wasn't just a statement. How do you get bankers who have been trained, conditioned for years to think as bankers to now huh, think as techies? And how they did it was what was the difference. So example, the statement, what would Jeff do became a mantra across the bank. Jeff is who? Jeff Bezos from Amazon. So now in a meeting, instead of conditioned to the way you've always solved a problem or addressed a customer issue, you now think about it like, how would Jeff do it? But a mantra on its own is not enough. So the bank visited the leading tech companies in the world. And from that, they created an acronym or mnemonic called Gandalf. So they took lessons from like Google, Amazon, LinkedIn, like open source and collectivity. And the wizardry and those who are token fans will remember Gandalf is the wizard. And that gives you the imagination as an employee. Suddenly you apply the wand to make banking joyful, which became the, the passion, the, the, the direction of the bank. How do you do that? And suddenly it wasn't just think like a techie, but we have to then benchmark and learn from others. And the third and final part was they also provided a very clear roadmap, not just for the IT, but for the whole bank through the whole transformation. Wonderful. And I, certainly the creativity definitely comes through in the acronyms, uh, along with many other things. So thank you, Robin, for sharing that. Um, so let's now, you know, talk some of the war stories. Uh, Bidu, coming to you for some of these. Now, there must have been, for instance, some countries that were that were a particular challenge. Um, in India, for instance, uh, I remember you mentioned uh, to me once that you started the bank on a mobile phone. Now, would you consider India to be one of your major overseas successes? I'm sure it wasn't easy. How did that happen? Sure, I'll, I'll I'll jump on a story, but just want to just add. I mean, Robin, uh, thanks for that. I it brought back yes, <laughs> the yeah, memories, <laughs> Matrix, yeah. So so just uh, another example of where we push it to the edge because it is about signaling to the people that change is serious and it it is something that we want people to engage in. So I remember we we wanted in meetings we wanted people to uh, to question and to break the status quo. 
So we would actually randomly have this. We this is big. It's a big squirrel. It's a raccoon actually. Yeah. So we had this. We these raccoon costumes, and we had people that would randomly burst into meetings, including meetings with Piyush and our senior leaderships, with a huge hammer, and they would block put blocks on the table and they would smash it and like tell people, I hope you are questioning and breaking the status quo. So we are we are big on the signals and theatrics of change, because. That's what gets people excited and to embrace. Okay, so coming back to your question, India. India is, uh, it's really interesting for us uh, because we were foreign bank in India. And as a foreign bank, we were regulated where we could only have 12 branches. Now for anyone that knows India, India is huge and 12 branches is nothing. So as a result, for about a decade, we only had about 14,000 customers, very small footprint. Knowing that the mobile phone was now all over the place. And plus India had introduced an Aadhaar card or an, an ID card. We knew that we could build out a bank completely on the phone, signatureless, paperless. You could open a bank account in 90 seconds. But talking about, Annette mentioned uh, regulations, KYC or know your customer, we needed people's fingerprint because that was linked to the ID card. So. We said, okay, how would what would Jeff do? What how would this, how would these large companies or these disruptive companies approach it and think about it? So we did some customer insight and we found the most ideal customers love coffee. So we went and we put a fingerprint reader in Cafe Coffee Day, which is the equivalent of Starbucks, and we put a fingerprint reader in every coffee shop and we put ourselves on the menu so you could order a cappuccino, a latte, or TBS bank account. And what happened is we went from 10 years, 14,000 customers to the next 18 months, we onboarded 2 million customers. So it completely changed our footprint in the market. And it was, when we talk about digital transformation, we use the technology because we completely re-engineered our product. We use customer insights so the customer obsession, and we introduced, I guess, or we use the mentality of the startup. But when we did this entire thing, we we told our internal teams that we would not outsource it. We would build it with our own management teams and we would deliver it with our own tech teams. That's why uh, in India and Digibank, our mascot is what we call Digo the dinosaur. And it's very much a signal to our own internal team to always remind ourselves that even a dinosaur can survive extinction if they're willing to change their mindset and the way they operate. And Biju, if I add on to what you shared and Annette shared earlier, and you can share how, you know, the challenge was as a branchless operation, the cost of the finger, the thumbprints in the equivalent Starbucks, the Gappies, were, I think, $50. Yeah. And it was much cheaper than building a branch because you needed to physically get the, so the cost of entry into the market dramatically shifted. I mean, we ended up from 12 branches to suddenly having a footprint of 600 locations simply yeah. by approaching it in a different way. Yeah. Going back to the idea of creativity that I think Robin uh, spoke about earlier, right? They have coffee, tea, or a DBS bank account uh, while you're at it. <laughs> so very interesting. And, and I like the stories about raccoons and dinosaurs. It sounds like something that might happen on our campus at INSEAD, actually, uh, more than what you'd imagine in a bank. So that's, that's very interesting indeed. Um, and, you know, we spoke about uh, an overseas um, situation. Let's talk closer home uh, in Singapore. Now, one of the things that we all love is a David versus Goliath story, you know, where an underdog, uh, unsuspected uh, to be anything major, comes in and suddenly overcomes this giant. I'm talking, of course, about the Grab versus Uber challenge. Uh, and I know that DBS had a role to play there. So, Vidyut, can you tell us a little bit about what role exactly that did DBS play in that very exciting story? Sure. Uh, okay, I guess I, I like the story. It resonates because I mean it's very easy to get stories where you're looking at customer. They always generate the, the really the sexy stories. This one is a business to business one. So yes, uh, it was. This is you're looking going back to the heydays when Grab and Uber are fighting amongst each other, which was great for consumers because you were getting nice prices all over the place. But Grab came to us and they were like, like you know, Singapore company, Singapore bro, bro, can you can you help us out? We, we seem to be losing traction. And so we said, okay, let's co-create. And uh, some of the techniques that were successful within DBS, we said, let's apply them 
to the problem statement that Grab has. And we found that if you look at a ride share going from point A to point B, it's, it's, the function is the same. But if you talk about a service, we found that the best service was provided by part-time drivers. A part-time driver, they were using their own car. It was generally cleaner. It was generally better looked after. The drivers more energized because they weren't driving the whole day. They had stories to tell. So we found part-time drivers were getting way better ratings than full-time drivers. And all the part-time drivers at that time was sitting on the Uber side. Grab was new. So we went and we said, okay, why is a driver doing part-time driving? And of course, the insight is because they want cash. And we found that the reconciliation process, after you finished a drive, the driver, it would probably take about three to four days before they got their money. So he said, okay, this is something that we could solve. So again, putting on the tech hat, putting on the customer hat, putting on the startup mentality, we ended up building out a set of real-time APIs and we put it into the Grab driver app. And the journey became that the moment the customer or the passenger left the ride and closed the door, the driver could instantly get access to the money. You solve the problem of why a part-time driver is a part-time driver. Suddenly there was a huge shift of drivers going in and jumping into the Grab uh, application. Now that's not the only reason why, of course, they, it ended up where it ended up, but we'd like to say we were we played a role and there was a part there that uh, we contributed to. I'm sure it was an, an important role, absolutely. So thank you, that, that's very, very interesting. And the questions are rolling in, so let me try and bring in a few of the very interesting questions we're getting from the audience. Annette, a question for you now. Uh, this is from yeah. Chris Roth. Um, and his, his question is, banks in emerging markets do not have the same starting point, for instance, when it comes to technology, as banks in the old markets, such as Java Bank, yeah. which, which you spoke about. So the transformation does not seem to look the same at all the banks, and the emerging market banks could perhaps even have an advantage here. So what's yeah. your comment on that? No, I, I, I would fully agree there. You know, I'm kind of jealous of BQ and, and the growing markets he's in. And... Um, and I think the fact, in, yeah, so on the one hand, in emerging markets, you see also other players like telcos and so on getting very actively in those markets and, and doing payment and other things. So you have to be quite quick and you have to be very customer oriented, like BQ uh, described. But you don't, are not sitting on this enormous, at least, heap of existing customers with existing legacy and existing data. And, and that's a big advantage. And I think, uh, and, and if you think about what is the most difficult for banks in mature markets, it's really fighting for the innovation. So the things BQ describes, um, I'm jealous of them. It's not that we don't have the ideas. I think there've been many, many really cool ideas, but to put a focus on them, to be able to scale them and to keep within all the regulatory boundaries is a major issue for banks in mature markets. And um, you know, having gone out of Singapore into the Asian market, which was just on the you know at exactly the right time when the mobile internet was exploding, um, was a great move. And um, I think for incumbent markets in Europe, but also in the US, um, it's um, there's so much house cleaning to do and the regulatory restrictions, I, um, I think the combination makes it, uh, makes it significantly more difficult than when you are in an emerging market. Absolutely, and in and fact, I, yeah, Richard, go ahead. I will say, and then I think you really touched on an, on an important point. So, okay, so just, so Piyush, myself, Kui Chuan, Paul, there's a couple of us that do, we, we actively speak yeah. a lot. And I remember Peter, our chairman, at one stage, he said, he said, you guys, you guys talk too much. You all overshare. <laughs> Aren't you all worried that people are going to, uh, to basically mimic us and get ahead? And you know, the reality is that there is no shortage of knowledge and ideas out there to the point you made, Annette. It does come down to execution, belief in execution. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, and that's why I, f I find a lot of people fall short. So even when we go out and we, we go to an event or a conference, we stress very heavy on our leadership that they come back that say, you must have learned something, put it into action. That's the part where I feel a lot of it falls short. It's not the knowledge, it's the action. Yeah, but even, yeah, even the action, it's, um, 
it's it's the scaling, I think, which is the issue. It's not yes. developing the concept and making it great, but scaling it, rolling it out, having the resources, uh, you know, and 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 everything is. Uh, I think that's that's where most banks uh, kind of struggle. It's a legacy, and also there are you know there are lots of uh, people in the audience have the same concerns around regulation. So perhaps I'll ask yeah. you all to comment a little bit more about that. Uh, and with you, we have Christoph, who's also um, saying hello and uh, saying that you brought back some great memories for his uh, work with DBS. Christoph, good to hear that. And uh, now his question is uh, basically on this uh, issue of regulation. So the MAS and the government policies in Singapore are very conducive to digital. Uh, so do you think your model can be duplicated in countries with more conservative regulators to the point that Annette was making earlier? So think? one is yes, completely agree. I mean, we are we've got a huge advantage with MAS being so progressive, and uh, I mean, recently I was speaking at a conference about I think there were some questions on Web three and DeFi, etc. It's really, I mean, it's a blessing that I, that you're sitting over here where the regulator, instead of saying no to something it does doesn't understand, it it'll say let's try and then we'll sort of figure it out so that that maybe and that openness is super cool. So yes, in other markets, it's very different. Uh, but that's where what we do is we use, we actually use MAS to our advantage because we, because we are, I guess, in so many industry and working groups, we take the approach that you can sit back and say, oh, regulation is stopping us, so we can't do it. Or you can proactively push because the regulator is there at the end He's not there to restrict the bank. He's there to protect the ecosystem and the community and various stakeholders. So we will actually very actively champion and work with regulators. And to regulators in other markets, we'll say, okay, this is what MAS is doing. And we'll offer broker bilateral discussions between the two, or we'll set ourselves up to say, let us lead an industry working group or a white paper or an experiment. It is it's, I guess, up to you as an incumbent on how aggressive you want to be to change the regulations. Regulations are not there to curb. At the same time, I mean, I, I do say that sometimes we pull out the unfair card and say, you look at all the tech companies and fintechs that are running around rampant. They don't have some of the encumbrance yeah, but- that we have, or we think twice because we yeah. understand the clients. They're happy to get their hands slapped. So yes, sometimes we do limit ourselves, but I, I would say is you step forward rather than standing still or worse, stepping back. So Annette, you, you maybe, wanted to jump yeah, in? Yeah, maybe, yeah, I'm just, first of all, um, what's really interesting now, if you might've seen that in, in Europe, they have now the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Service Act and really curbing the big tech significantly. And that's based, the philosophy is based on banking regulation. So how they, how they go about it. So actually it's swapping over from banking regulation to big tech now, so which is really interesting. Um, and, and about regulation, I think for me, the bottleneck is not so much, you know, the regulation of the new things you do. I think you can work around and work with most regulators. The big thing is all the other regulation, which draws away so much time and resources. So uh, I think that's more the issue than the regulation of new ideas and new ventures um, and, and balancing that. That is for me, the real struggle. And I think Ernst Verbeek uh, in our audience would agree with you. Um, you know, his question was, can you really build a sustainable business model for a bank when one in six employees have to work in compliance? So I guess that's, you know, we can feel your pain, Ernst. Uh, and, you know, to some extent, I think we, we all uh, empathize. Uh, but let me move to a broader question uh, from the audience here now. Uh, this is from Basihar Hassan, who's asking, should banks acquire fintech companies or transform themselves? Which is the better approach? I'm sure Robin and Bidyut, you both have strong views on that one. Uh, Robin, shall I come to you first? And then we'll ask well, you. Like, this is Bidyut, heads up innovation. This is very much his field. So let him take it. All first. right, go, go through then, you. So, you know, it's, uh, I remember I was asked to do a, a little position paper to the, to the to MES because we had the World uh, Economic Forum delegates visiting. And I put up this picture of Spider-Man, the red Spider-Man and the black Spider-Man basically talking about you've got their collaborators and competitors. Uh, you know, from our perspective, when we built out the India Digibank, we built it on the on the top of three fintechs. 
So we partnered with three startups and we introduced our solution, packaging our technology and embedding some of the startup technologies. So from that perspective, I don't think it's a clear cut where your strategy has to be, I'm with them or against them. It very much is, they are, they are spaces where startups, they do a way better job than us. And because they are niche, because they're dedicated, because they have insights, because they're more nimble, and especially when it's up to new tech. And we are very pro, we run a program where we very, very actively work with them. And in many instances, we have to seduce them to work with us because they don't want to touch us. So we go out of our way to date them and court them. But on the other hand, there are some areas where they are very clear in, uh, in competition with us. And then what they're doing is they're uplifting the baseline. And it's up to us if we want to stay in that space and stay relevant for us to not only match them, but beat them. So we have a, a clear, uh, I guess, a clear understanding, but we don't have any hard and fast strategy that you treat them as one or the other is, is very much a horses for courses. And Pedro, if I just maybe to summarize it from a bigger perspective, they've gone from being a threat to a collaboration where now, yeah. we avoided and it was a threat and they were going to take the business to now, and you know, you haven't touched, but the, the hackathons and you know, um, bringing people in, uh, twenty-year-olds in jeans and t-shirts, and talking to forty-year-old, uh, forty years in banking, and just shifting their thinking and leveraging their different perspective is what the bank did so well. But uh, to Annette's yeah. point, now with the changing yeah. regulation scape on how that's shifting, it's actually a lot of them are, they have also no choice because their models are currently exactly. unviable if they can't leverage and lean on, as was mentioned, the one in six compliance people that we have <laughs> sitting at our yeah. yeah, no, and and just to, to take it a bit more from a academic point of view. So what you see is, is starting your own business is in many ways, preferably because you built your own skills, um, you built your own energy, you can tailor the culture and everything exactly to your company. It has two drawbacks. First of all, it very often takes quite a bit of time uh, before it becomes you know, any size which is meaningful to the bank. So you have to have patience for it to change the business model of the bank. And the other thing is that um, when you uh, start your own business um, and you start scaling up, it really affects your P&L. You have to put in the money and you have to you know, tell your shareholders, please be patient. It will come in a couple of years. If you buy a startup, it doesn't affect your P&L. You just, you know, you put it in your balance sheet and in worst case, you impair it somewhere below the net income and no one notices it. So it's a much easier way to, um, yeah, to get additional profit and income. And then people say always, oh, well, and then I buy all these skills in rather than, um, than uh, you know, having to build them up myself. What you see as a problem very often that very often those growing digital businesses don't integrate well and they stay very separate or the people leave after four years when once they get their earn out. So it seems a, you know, a shortcut in the short term, uh, but it is also highly risky that after three or four years you actually destroyed value. You pay too much and it doesn't integrate and people leave. So if you can grow it yourself, but be aware, you have to be early on the curve, like you guys were at the beginning of the mobile internet curve. And you have to be willing to invest the money and explain that to your shareholders, that, uh, that that's what you're doing. To that point, we don't have a ventures arm, so we don't go down yeah. that path of investing. We are very much on the other side of uh, co-creating or collaborating, but yeah. not investing. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Okay, and uh, let me just move on to something uh, different now because we have lots and lots of questions. And I think this one is definitely a billion dollar question. So the, the one about crypto uh, and how it's going to disrupt the traditional banking industry. So how will crypto and decentralized finance disrupt the traditional banking industry? Why are banks so slow in adopting this? Uh, even that APIs and integrations are so easy with the crypto world. Um, we have this question from Yaroslav Popov, who would like to take this one. I mean, I'll just say, if, uh, the moment I get the answer, I, I won't be here. Uh, but okay, I'll tell you the stance that we've taken. So we've got uh, we've got a an innovation radar that we we've crafted, and we 
we look at these trends to try and determine what's the DBS house view. And I, I recall going back a bunch of years when we were looking at this space, our first view was don't touch it. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, we actually put it out in public where we had our CEO, our CIO at the time talk about it being a Ponzi scheme. We revisited it and we revisited it and we, we changed our view and we looked, one of course is I'll, I'll separate blockchain and crypto. So we looked at blockchain as an enabling technology and what we could do. And we took a very aggressive stance. And then we also looked at crypto in regards to what it what it holds. Uh, and this, this rush of investments and speculation in the area. And of course, we're not a charity. So from that perspective, looking at the opportunity, we knew that there was something to be had and there was something to be done in the right way so now we've got a, a blockchain platform where we've got a range of different platform uh, blockchain based products but in the crypto space we did end up uh, becoming i think at that time i'm not sure we still are the, the uh, asian backed we've got a crypto exchange uh, we've got a, a bond tokenization and asset tokenization engine and we've got a digital custody service which is in very much in this crypto space so we have we don't have the answers, but we have definitely dipped more than just our toe in the water. And so far, so good. Uh, we are, we're definitely keeping a watch, but where, uh, if I look at what's happening on the big tech space to what Annette was mentioning in Europe on how the regulations are sort of shifting, as there is more and more movement, it, we, we look, I think, I think it's dipped three trillion, but it's still, uh, much much smaller if you look at the the larger uh, financial structure and system so it is definitely get caught attention and i think regulations will shift i think even players within the industry are in many instances asking for regulation to legitimize so it is a space where there are more questions rather than answers I, but personally i love it i, I just love the space there is so much happening there. Uh, it's a it's a space definitely where all bets are, are valid. And uh, just to add on, um, a few a couple of months ago, Piyush and I were doing a, a, an interview, and you know one of the questions that came up is you know what what does the bank focus on the most in the next five years? And Piyush's answer was AI, which won't surprise anyone because AI is very much going to be the driver of operations as we know, and so much machine learning and banking as we look at AML, anti-money laundering and other areas. But the other area, just to, to reinforce what Bidu has shared, is he said blockchain. And the thinking has so much shifted in those few years from we're not going to touch it to now blockchain is one of the biggest things in the next few years. Yeah, and, and, and interesting enough, because the central banks are looking at it very, very seriously and introducing, you know, digital coins instead of cash. And so uh, it is actually, it's it's a bit in the hype phase at the moment, but that's at the same time also the fun phase. So, so much going on and you know, where, knowing where to place your bets and where to put your toe in the water is, um, is uh, well, um, it's it now is the time to do it. Talking about uh, you know, be your digital early. bets, Annette. Your digital <laughs> bets, not your cash bets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But it, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at if you look at the rise of crypto and how it's come in as an anti-establishment, uh, so it's the same. I, I draw the lines on when they introduce skateboarding into the Olympics. A lot of the purists were like skateboarding is a grungy underground sport. You put it in the Olympics, that is just the worst thing you can do. You made it uncool. So I, I'm I'm looking at the whole crypto space and saying as it moves into this regulatory and all the banks and all jump in, it might be becoming a little uncool. So you might want to jump in when it's hip and hot. Okay, perhaps as we start moving towards the last questions, let me move to you know to uh, from the future to the to what it was all about, the customers. Uh, I remember when we were researching uh, the article, Robin. Uh, you know, I um, there was uh, I read about how um, uh, DBS has this concept of customer obsession, and we have a question here that I think is really important from that uh, perspective uh, from Celestine, who's asking about how do you convince a traditional customer base to move to digital practices and processes? It's all very well for us want to want to do it, but there are some people who just aren't convinced. So, so there's an easy way and there's a hard way and there's the accelerated way. The fastest way is uh, you bring upon a global pandemic and everyone <laughs> becomes 
pro digital so that's definitely worked from that perspective but if i go back to when there was a choice so there's a difference between circumstance and choice uh, for us with the way we were positioned in singapore very different to how we operate in the markets in the markets we were the fintech we were the new boys we were uh, the startup so we went full digital and we looked at leveraging all the economies of technology and scale a low cost of acquisition high engagement etc in singapore being uh, being more of the incumbent we and also having what's called posp which is our community or our, our brand as well we are much more cautious that there is sections and segments of the community that do have these preferences and that we are to a certain extent obligated to serve them uh, but it doesn't stop us from trying to move them across. So we often uh, cite the example of when you go into the Apple store and you've got all the Apple geniuses, they will facilitate you at the store, but they will try to inculcate the digital uh, know-how to show you how you could have done it yourself. So they stand shoulder to shoulder where you all are sharing the screen and they're walking you through the digital process with the hope that the next time you'll just say, did I really need to go into the branch? So it is uh, a journey. We are unable to just completely switch off. And But yes, we have created what's called a digital value capture. We've shown to our shareholders that the digital uh, arena is more benefit, beneficial to the customer also, even though they don't know it. And in some instances, we make hard decisions and we have to be more aggressive on some of our services. Uh, but yeah, in certain countries, we're a little bit more cautious with how we approach it. Okay. Manette, did you have a comment? Yeah, no, I just, it, I think at the end of the day, it, it, with us, the digital transition went so much faster. So Holland is a very high digital country, but still, the, the speed of the shift, and, and it has to do a lot with the convenience of the app and really taking away the pain points. And, you know, kids start teaching their grandparents, and that's what you really have. Um, it's more complicated if you talk wholesale or, you know, business to business. Uh, there, the journey is uh, more complicated. But with consumers, you really, you have to seduce them and you have to make it really easy. And, and in our experience, um, it went much faster and much quicker um, than we thought it would. So, um, and, and of course, you have to have some servants for a few people who can't do it, but you can even have people going to their homes and helping them. If you don't need to have this whole big branch network uh, to the extent you used to have it. Um, there's a lot of uh, cost savings you have. You can uh, invest in helping those few who, who can't uh, go to the digital world. And I'll just throw in a quick comment just to say, and there are some customers who they won't become digital. And one of the stories when I was researching the book, the world's best bank was, you know, the, the wealth management team shared how the, the older member of the family would want to meet their relationship manager. And while they were in the meeting at their home, the younger member of the family would be on their app doing the transaction. And of course, <laughs> we all know you need that balance today. Wonderful. And we still have some very interesting questions, in, including one on sustainability that I was keen on, but I'm being reminded that we're out of time. So from making banking joyful to take the bank, taking the banking out of banking, to positioning itself as a technology company delivering banking services, and to benchmarking itself not against other banks, but against leading tech companies, DBS has clearly taken many path-breaking steps that have set it apart. And what I personally admire most is something that was referred to uh, in the conversation, which is the attitude of the management, uh, starting from the top leadership, including the CEO, Piyush Gupta, in terms of the willingness to share the lessons that have been learned, the war stories about the failures and the successes that have gone to make it the best bank uh, for a better world. Uh, and so we've had a good example of that today. Many important lessons learned by all of us, I think. So a very big thank you to our panelists, Annette, Vidyut, and Robin. And of course, to our audience for great engagement and some excellent questions. And a big thank you also to the wonderful team at Digital at NCR for making this happen. Thank you so much and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.